Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. The third mainline Zelda game and oftentimes cited as the best Zelda game of all time. Today, I'm going to beat the game and give my thoughts on my experience. Does it age like fine blue potion, or is it just an overhyped game of the past? During my playthrough, I actually discovered a lot of strange and interesting things that I've never heard anyone talk about for this game before, so make sure to watch this video all the way through to hear all those interesting details. I'm on a journey to beat every Zelda game in order of release, so make sure to subscribe for future videos to catch your favorite Zelda games. A Link to the Past was actually the very first Zelda game I've ever played, where I first played on my dad's Super Nintendo console when I was like 5 years old. Being that young, I was barely competent enough to play the game the intended way, so I just wandered around aimlessly in the light world, attacking cuckoos, and killing whatever the heck these things are. But I've never gotten very far in this game at all as a young kid, so 18 years later, after getting attacked by my first cuckoo flock, I'm going to finally play this game all the way through. Before I play through, I will allow myself to read through the game's manual, to look for clues on how this game works. I'm looking through the manual because when this game came out in the early 90s, players had access to the manual that came with the game, so I'm trying to make this an authentic experience. I won't be using any save states during this playthrough or looking up anything online. So without further ado, let's start off with reading through the game's manual to see what this game's all about. Now I won't bore you by reading through the whole manual in this video because it's pretty long, so I'll talk about the highlights. This manual kicks off with setting the stage for the story of the game, where it discusses how Hyrule was created, as well as the origin of the Triforce. According to the manual, the gods of power, wisdom, and courage created the earth, science, magic, and life of Hyrule. In addition, the gods created the Triforce which contained the essence of the gods, and whoever worthy of the Triforce would find it and be able to use it to make their wishes come true. This caused many greedy people to search for the wish-granting Triforce, and a gang of thieves was able to use black magic to open the gate to the Golden Lands, where the Triforce was housed. More specifically, the evil Ganondorf Dragmire, also known by his alias of Mandrag Ganon, took control of the Triforce, and over time, an evil power began brewing in the Golden Land. After Ganon built up enough followers, he attacked Hyrule Castle, which bought enough time for the Seven Wise Men to seal Ganon in the Golden Land, which later became known as the Imprisoned Dark World. This battle is known as the Imprisoning War, and everyone rejoiced at its conclusion, as many people died during that war. Centuries had passed since the end of the Imprisoning War, and many people forgot about the war entirely. Hyrule began experiencing a new problem though, where disease and drought took over the land, despite the Dark World still being sealed away. Hillians tried to find the source of these problems, and a stranger named Agahim came forward and stopped the disease and drought. As a reward, the King of Hyrule granted Agahim the position of Chief Advisor and heir to the Seven Wise Men. Many regarded Agahim as a hero at the time, but some questioned his loyalty to Hyrule due to strange experiments taking place by him at the castle at night. From here, the story continues at the beginning of the game, where Link wakes up in his bed to Zelda telepathically communicating with him. And I have to say, the story introduction in this manual is a lot more put together and well thought out compared to the story described in the Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 manuals. I made videos on those two games as well, similar to this style of video if you want to check those out. The links for those are in the top comment of this video. So the basic premise of A Link to the Past is that Ganon and the evil wizard Agahim are trying to take control of the Light World, and it's Link's duty to travel to the Dark World and stop them. From here, the manual goes into depth on what the different buttons do on your controller, as well as how to perform various actions in-game. The manual also explains the different items you will find along your adventure, enemies you will face, and hints on how to progress in the game. Right off the bat, I can tell that this game is a lot less cryptic than Zelda 1 or Zelda 2, as the manual thoroughly explains the mechanics of the game and even straight up tells you exactly what to do at certain parts of the game. It's also apparent that the formula and various items from this game were reused in later Zelda games, such as being the first Zelda game with the Light World and Dark World system, the Master Sword, the Spin Attack, Pieces of Heart, Empty Bottle Items, Kakariko Village, Kakus, and many popular Zelda songs that would be reused or remixed in later Zelda games. Also, one fun fact is that A Link to the Past was the first Zelda game to actually call the dungeons dungeons, where Zelda 1 called them underground labyrinths, and Zelda 2 called them palaces. So in an attempt to not spoil aspects of this game from the get-go, I won't dwell too much on the contents of this manual. So let's start playing A Link to the Past and see how this game holds up 32 years after its release. The game kicks off with Link lying in his bed as he hears Princess Zelda communicating with him using telepathy. She informs him that she is imprisoned in Hyrule Castle, and the evil wizard Agahim is trying to break the seal between the light and dark worlds. Right when Link wakes up, his uncle informs him that he'll be going out for a bit and to stay put in the house. It's interesting that this game introduces one of Link's family members, because for most of the Zelda games that exist, Link's family is unknown. So immediately upon getting out of bed, I disobeyed Link's uncle and started wandering outside. 
On my trek to Hyrule Castle, I came across this interesting sign which read, I will give 100 rupees to the man who finds the descendants of the wise men. Signed, The King. This sign adds more depth to the plot of this game, where it is implied that the wizard Agahim placed this sign here while posing as the king because he wants the descendants of the seven wise men to open the door to the dark world. Little plot elements like this are seen throughout the game, which enhance the storytelling of this game. This is a nice change of pace from Zelda 1 and Zelda 2, where in Zelda 1, there's barely any dialogue, and in Zelda 2, you'd be lucky to find anyone that speaks a sentence longer than five words. Also, I think it's kind of funny how Agahim set the bounty on this sign at 100 rupees. Like, you'd think he'd be able to fork over more dough, considering that obtaining the seven wise men's descendants would literally fulfill his entire life's purpose of bringing Ganon to the light world. Like, you can't even buy a red potion with that many rupees. So anyway, from here I walked around the outskirts of the castle, picked up this conspicuous looking bush, and fell into a secret passage. Right upon entering the castle, you find your uncle mortally wounded and on his deathbed, and you take his sword and shield off of his lifeless corpse. Right before he dies, he says, Zelda is your... dot dot dot. I don't think there's any clear consensus among Zelda fans on what your uncle is trying to say here, but I have a good idea. In the Japanese version of this game, the dialogue in this part translates to You are the princess's dot dot dot, implying that your uncle is trying to say something like You are the princess's only hope. Since the English version of this game was translated from the Japanese version that was created first, it can be assumed that the uncle in the English version is trying to say something like Zelda is your destiny. When I first read this dialogue, my mind first went towards a Luke and Leia type situation, where the uncle might have been saying, Zelda is your sister, but I sure hope that isn't what the translators were going for here. Also, another thing I wanted to talk about regarding Link's uncle is his death scene. I know that the developers killed off Link's uncle to try and make the player feel negatively towards the wizard, Agahim, and Ganon, but the player meets Link's uncle only like five minutes before he ends up dying, so there's not much time to develop an attachment towards the guy. I feel like his death would have had a lot more of an impact on the player if Link's uncle stayed alive for at least until Link enters the Dark World for the first time. That's just a minor nitpick of mine, but it's not really too big of a deal. So after killing some soldiers corrupted by Agahim's evil magic, I found Princess Zelda and started escorting her to the Sanctuary. After making my way through some sewers, I made it to the Sanctuary, and at this point in the game, you are pretty free to roam around the Light World wherever you want to and explore. I stumbled across this fortune teller guy that looks eerily similar to one of those happy happyism cultists from Earthbound. The point of this fortune teller is to give hints to Link on what to do next in his journey. The hints kind of suck though, and what seems a tad unethical is that the fortune teller doesn't tell me the price of the service until after he tells me my fortune, where the price he charges is dependent on his mood at the time. That has to be illegal. So after getting scammed, I made my way south into Kakariko Village. After murdering a cuckoo for old time's sake, I bought a bottle for 100 rupees and I found the dialogue pretty funny because it memes on the fact that Link always holds the item over his head when he collects a new item. When you buy the bottle, the salesman says, Thanks a lot, now hold it above your head for the whole world to see, okay? And this is followed by the classic item music, accompanied by Link holding the bottle over his head. The reason why the developers have Link holding items over his head is to allow the player to see what they just collected, but I found it pretty funny how the devs poked fun at themselves at how ridiculous it would look if you held something above your head to celebrate after picking it up. Also, if you were wondering, by the time A Link to the Past came out, Link holding a newly collected item above his head after picking it up had already been a well-established feature of the Legend of Zelda franchise, where Link can be seen holding items above his head upon collection in Zelda 1 on the NES, as well as Zelda 2 on the NES. So after getting a bug net from Dora the Explorer and geeking over a Mario painting easter egg, I talked to this coconut head looking guy who gave me a hint on where the first dungeon is. After traveling east for a bit, I came across this guy named Sasarasasasla, or however the heck you pronounce it. I swear this guy's name is a tongue twister. Anyway, Mr. S here fills you in on some lore, where he tells you that you need to collect three pendants to be able to obtain the Master Sword. With that, I made it into the first dungeon of the game, Eastern Palace. This dungeon was pretty easy, but it introduced a lot of cool features that were never before seen in a Zelda game up until this point. For one, the puzzles in A Link to the Past are significantly more complex than those two Zelda games on the NES. Zelda 1 mainly relied on cryptic bomb or block push puzzles, where you have to push a random block or bomb a random wall to unlock a secret area. Zelda 2 was a more combat-focused game, but its puzzles relied more on the player getting confused and lost in its dungeons. A Link to the Past, however, offers puzzles that involve doing things like entering the correct one-way door at the right moments, pressing the correct switch at the right time, or falling down the correct pit by being aware of what's on the floors that are below you. One of the biggest reasons why I loved this game's dungeons was that they were able to mimic a 3D environment in a 2D game. 
Zelda 2 scratched the surface of this feature, where part of the game controlled in a top-down perspective, and the rest of it controlled in a 2D side-scroller. But A Link to the Past does it better, where this game has wall masters falling from the ceiling, objects you can pick up and throw, as well as pathways that exist in the foreground and background. I'll talk about each dungeon individually in this video, but each dungeon in A Link to the Past is unique and offers a well-thought-out set of challenges that get more and more complex as you progress through the game. This first dungeon was a piece of cake though, as it mostly serves as an introduction for the player on how typical 2D Zelda dungeons work, where you have your standard dungeon item that you have to find, enemies to kill to progress, locked doors to unlock, and a boss at the end to fight. After killing this pretty easy and simple boss, I made my way back to Mr. S who hooked me up with the location of the two other pendants, as well as the Pegasus boots that make you run super fast, and a hint for the location of the Ice Rod. The Ice Rod is a cool novelty item that you can use to freeze enemies, but I didn't find myself using it much in regular combat. It is a required item to beat the game, however, where you needed to kill a boss towards the end of the game. After getting the Ice Rod, I found a secret area with an angry looking guy who gave me a fat stack of 300 rubies, under the condition that I don't tell anyone about it. This kind of goes without saying, but this is a reference to the original The Legend of Zelda on the NES, where you can find secret areas with moblins that give you rupees if you keep it a secret. I found this whole exchange in A Link to the Past very ironic though, because the person who gives you the rupees is literally called a thief in the game's official guide. I guess he was just feeling generous that day or something. After filling up my wallet, I wandered around for a bit more, and after running into a bunch of trees to try and uncover secrets, to my surprise, I ran into a tree and a bunch of apples fell to the grounds. These apples restore a little bit of health when touched, but interestingly enough, apples wouldn't make an appearance in another Zelda game for a little over two decades, where A Link Between Worlds would have apples that restore health, as well as the more widely known Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. So yes, Breath of the Wild wasn't the first game to introduce apples that you can eat in a Zelda game. It was actually A Link to the Past. That's just a little fun fact to add to your list of Zelda knowledge. After wandering around some more, I loaded up on some pieces of heart, bashed into this suspicious looking bookcase to obtain the Book of Medora, and like 30 minutes later, I found out that apparently I need this book to unlock the second dungeon of the game, Desert Palace. What a coincidence. So after playing some Ring Around the Rosie with some frog statues, I entered the next dungeon. After wandering around for a bit, I found a telepathy box to communicate with Mr. S. These boxes are located all throughout the game, where sometimes you'll be able to talk to Zelda with them, but most of the time it's that Mr. S guy who gives you hints on how to proceed through the game. Mr. S sort of acts as a companion, similar to Navi in Ocarina of Time, or Fee in Skyward Sword, except minus the part where he follows you around and annoys you to no end. In a way, this would make Mr. S the first ever companion in a Zelda game, where many future Zelda games would mimic this formula. Your communication with him is pretty limited, however, so I can see why people wouldn't label him as a true companion. Traveling through this second dungeon marked the point where I hit the maximum ruby count of 999. If I had to point out one minor flaw of this game, it would be the lack of opportunities to buy stuff with rupees. This game throws so many rupees at you, where I was stuck at around 999 rupees for most of my playthrough. There are some important things that you should buy with your rupees, such as the flippers for 500 rupees, or an empty bottle for 100 rupees. But I didn't find much else to spend my money on. I could have bought some potions, but I had my trusty bug net that I used to catch fairies, so I didn't really see the point of loading up on potions. Now I can sense all you Link to the Past nerds typing away in the comment section about the Pond of Happiness, where you can spend at least a thousand rupees over time to upgrade your bomb and arrow capacity. I didn't realize this was a thing, because after tossing in 20 rupees for the first time, nothing happens. So I didn't try to keep tossing rupees in. Apparently, after each interval of 100 rupees that you toss in, you can choose to upgrade your bombs or arrows, with each being able to be maxed out at 50 for bombs and 70 for arrows. This pond is actually talked about in the game's manual, but I guess I wasn't feeling charitable enough to just toss all my rupees in the pond and see what would happen. I did the math though, and even if I put in the maximum amount of rupees in the Pond of Happiness, I would still have 999 rupees for a decent chunk of the game, due to how many rupees this game gives you. Especially in the Village of Outcasts, which is the Dark World variant of Kakariko Village in the Light World. I feel like it would have been nicer if I wasn't left to just spend all my rupees on potions towards the latter part of the game. So moving on from that tangent, this second dungeon was probably a little bit tougher than the first dungeon, but it was super linear and didn't offer much of a challenge. The combat was a little bit difficult at times though, with these statues that shoot lasers at you, as well as these sand pit monsters that shoot red beams. Also the boss was a little bit more challenging than the first dungeon's boss, so after obtaining the Pendant of Power, I made my way to the overworld. From here, I didn't do too much exploring, and made my way straight to Death Mountain. After scaling up the mountain for a bit, I came across this old guy who asked me to take him with me. 
This guy ended up being pretty trustworthy, as he gave me hints on which way to go in the cave, but I found it pretty funny that I wasn't able to sprint with the Pegasus boots while he was following me. Throughout the game, you were able to have people follow you and lead them around, and most of the time, the game lets you sprint at full speed. However, this old guy is pretty much the only exception where you can't sprint. Link enters the sprinting animation while moving at normal walking speed, and you can see the old guy's feet pedaling by super fast. The developers probably made this the case because you can't have some old guy sprinting across the screen like Usain Bolt, so I thought this was pretty funny. So after leading the elderly man to safety, he gave me a magic mirror that allows Link to move between the light and dark world, and this item could very well be the most important item in the game. The guy doesn't explain where he got the mirror from at all, but the game makes you wonder how this guy came across such a powerful item. Ganon's mission is to find a gate into the light world, so if one of Ganon's underlings just happened to push the old guy over and take the mirror, Link's entire quest would have failed. Later on in the game, you come to realize that the old guy's granddaughter is one of the descendants of the Seven Wise Men, so maybe that old guy you meet in the cave has ties to the magic of the ancient sages, and that's why he has access to the magic mirror. The game never expands on this though. From here, I entered the blue swirly thing and entered the dark world for the first time. For players that experienced this part of the game for the first time back in the early 90s, this must have been a surreal experience to realize that the content of A Link to the Past basically doubles from what you were expecting going into this game, where there's now an expansive dark world to explore that's just as big as the light world that you already journeyed through for some time. This feeling must have been comparable with how Zelda 1 on the NES transitioned to A Link to the Past being released, and how Breath of the Wild transitioned to Tears of the Kingdom being released. A Link to the Past Light World is probably about as big as Zelda 1's map, but A Link to the Past has twice as much area to explore, if you include the Dark World. Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild share the same map on the surface, but Tears of the Kingdom basically doubles the amount of explorable area of an already massive game, with the inclusion of Sky Islands and the Depths. So entering and discovering the Dark World for the first time must have really wowed Zelda fans playing A Link to the Past back in the day. Once in the Dark World, Link turns into a bunny rabbit because when people enter the Dark World, they transform into what reflects their true nature. In order to not be a bunny in the Dark World anymore, you have to find the Moon Pearl from the third dungeon that's located in the Light World. In rabbit form, Link can't use any weapons or items and can just walk around and talk to people. Based on my experience with Link, he seems like a courageous and loyal guy, so it doesn't really make any sense why he would transform into a cute and innocent defenseless rabbit in the Dark World. I guess Link has a soft, cuddly part that we don't know about or something. Once I found the Moon Pearl, it was pretty fun going up to people in the Dark World and seeing what things they were transformed into based on their true nature. Here are some notable ones that I came across during my adventure. We had the Cuckoos transition to Skeleton Cuckoos to demonstrate how evil and lifeless these beasts are. An archery minigame host turns into a weird alien that hits a drum with a ladle to demonstrate how cool and badass this guy is. And you had this hand looking thing in a cave in the Dark World that admits to being a thief in the Light World. So it appears that he's represented by a hand, due to his tendency to steal from people with his hands. Very fitting, I know. So after walking around the Dark World as a bunny for a short bit, I used the mirror to return to the Light World and enter the third dungeon, Tower of Hera. This next dungeon was a little bit more challenging than the first two, and it relied a lot more on puzzles such as making the player raise and lower blocks by hitting color switches, or step on these star-looking floor tiles to move manholes around. And yes, they're actually called manholes, believe it or not, according to the game's official manual. Honestly, that just seems like a translation error from Japanese to English. They should have been called pits or something. One of these puzzles actually stumped me for a hot minute, where you had to step on a certain star tile to open the floor in a certain area, and then fall into that hole in the floor below to obtain the moon pearl item. The boss of this dungeon was also pretty challenging, where you had to hit this caterpillar looking thing's tail while trying not to get knocked off by it. And if you fall down a hole, you have to climb up to the boss again, and the boss replenishes its health. So after crushing the bug, I collected the pendants and made my way into the Lost Woods and removed the Master Sword from its resting place, King Arthur style. On top of radiating an epic blue hue, this upgraded sword does more damage than Link's starting sword and allows Link to enter the hiding place of Aghanim, so in an effort to confront the evil wizard, I made my way into Hyrule Castle. The way up to Aghanim was basically just a combat gauntlet where you travel through rooms linearly and fight enemies. It wasn't too challenging, especially with Link's sword beam attack at full health, where you can just stand to the side and spam your sword beams at enemies across the room. So after a lot of progressing through rooms, I found Aghanim, who made Zelda disappear before my own eyes, breaking the seal of the Seven Wise Men. Aghanim teleports to the next room, and you have to fight him volleyball style in a pretty easy fight. Quite a few other Zelda games would repeat this type of boss fight, but this battle in A Link to the Past was actually the first instance of this style of boss fight. Also, you may already know this, but you can actually win this entire boss fight with just using your bug net item, instead of using your sword. Those are some serious style points right there. 
So after defeating Aghanim, he pulls you into the Dark World as an attempt to try and kill Link, but that would later prove to lead to Ganon's downfall, because in order to defeat Ganon, Link actually needs to see the Seven Maidens that are all scattered around in seven different dungeons in the Dark World. This actually makes The Link to the Past the Zelda game with the most dungeons in it, so with that, I begin exploring the Dark World. Right after setting foot off the pyramid, I found an interesting enemy called the Hinox. You may already know these guys from Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, but they initially made their debut in A Link to the Past as an enemy that hurls bombs at Link. This is actually an interesting enemy in the game, because the English version of the manual has a mistranslation that falsely describes the weak point of this enemy. The Japanese manual has a sentence that translates to, an eye for an eye, which the English manual translated to, aim for the eye if you want to find his weak point. Shooting the enemy in the eye with your bow, or slashing it in the eye with your sword, won't actually kill the enemy any faster than normal. The actual weak spot of the Hinox is Link's own bombs, where Link can kill a Hinox in one hit with one of his bombs. After exploring a bit more, I made my way towards the next dungeon in this game, and found this monkey in a maze. At the end of the maze, the monkey asks you for 10 rupees, and you can either give him 10 rupees, or choose the second option to never give him anything. Honestly, that second option seems a little harsh. Like, did the devs really need to word it like that? I was feeling charitable, and as a reward, the monkey follows you around a bit longer, until you bring him to the dungeon's entrance, where he asks you for 100 rupees to open the entrance. After saying yes, the monkey parkours its way up the dungeon, flips the switch, and opens the front door. So with that, I entered the next dungeon, the Dark Palace. This dungeon was pretty standard, but it was a little less linear than the three previous dungeons in the Light World, and it was decently challenging combat-wise. I'd say that this game does a really good job at progressing the difficulty of the dungeons as you progress through the game. Throughout my whole playthrough, I felt like each dungeon got progressively harder as I went, and this made the game feel really balanced. After walking around some, I found the magic hammer, which should honestly just be called the regular hammer, because I didn't notice anything magical about it. You can just knock down pegs with it to progress through areas. So after hitting some moles whack-a-mole style, I came across the dungeon's boss, which was actually pretty awesome looking. It was this giant dinosaur looking thing, and you had to hit its mask with your hammer until it breaks, and then you had to hit its green weakness splotch on its head. So after an intense battle, I whittled the boss's health and found myself with really low health with no fairies. And this happened. I clutched it, killed the dinosaur with one heart left to spare, and saved the captured maiden. With six more maidens left to save, I started wandering around and exploring when I came across this inbred looking half dog half dinosaur looking thing sitting on a stump, which is actually a Peter Pan flute guy from the Light World. I found his flute for him, and after playing him a tune, he turned into a tree. Based on my research, I can't explain why he turned into a tree, but I have a theory. When people go into the Dark World, they take the form of their true selves, and in the flute boy's case, he turned into this weird looking monster. Once Link finds the flute, the guy asks Link to play him a tune. I feel like he turns into a tree after hearing the melody, because his true self changes, so his appearance changes as well. Turning into a tree symbolizes his tranquility and that he is at peace with himself. That's just a theory that I thought of, but it makes the most sense in my opinion. Also, this flute is really important later on in the game, it is required to progress, where if you play it at a certain place in Kakariko Village, you unlock the ability to warp to different areas of the map, allowing you to access a new dungeon. After walking around a bit more, I went to the area marked as 2 because I thought that this was the required order that you're supposed to defeat the dungeons. I ended up defeating all the Dark World dungeons in the order stated on the map, but in reality, you can defeat some of the Dark World dungeons out of order, similar to how you could finish dungeons in the original The Legend of Zelda out of order. A Link to the Past's dungeons rely more on item puzzles, so certain Dark World dungeons are required to beat before others, but I've read online that a lot of people like beating these dungeons out of order, where for example, you could beat Dungeon 4 right after beating the Dark Palace, and you could even save Dungeon 2 for towards the end, if you really wanted to. But since I did things in the order that the developers intended, I made my way over to Dark World Dungeon number 2, called the Swamp Palace. This was a water dungeon that requires you to change water levels to be able to progress to certain floors of the dungeon. And considering my PTSD from an Ocarina of Time's water temple, I was already nervous going into this one. However, changing the water levels for this dungeon to progress was pretty easy, where once you pull a lever to change the water level once, that act is permanent, where you can't keep adjusting the water levels. Despite this, there were some non-linear moments in this dungeon, which added to the challenge, but it was only slightly harder than the first dungeon in the Dark World. 
A lot of this game's puzzles rely on you understanding what's located on floors above and below you, where you have to fall down certain pits to access new areas. This is a really smart way to craft puzzles, and makes the dungeons in this game have more depth to them, and require more thought to get through. You may not want to admit it, but this style of puzzle actually made its debut in Zelda 2 on the NES, where in that game, you have to have a good memory and know what's below you before you start jumping down random pits. Granted, A Link to the Past did it better, so I guess you could say that Zelda 2 walked so that A Link to the Past could run. So after doing some more puzzling around, I found the hookshot item and made my way to the dungeon's boss, which was honestly a little underwhelming compared to the epic dinosaur boss from the previous dungeon. In this boss fight, you have to use your hookshot to take away these floating shield things and then slash at the eye as the boss moves around in the fighting arena like that DVD screensaver logo. So after killing the boss and saving the second maiden, I wandered around the dark world for a bit and found a cave with a hint box that said apparently if you freeze an enemy with your ice rod and then kill it with your hammer, the enemy drops magic. It looks like buying that green potion really is a scam, when you know this trick. I'll just walk around comfortably with my 999 rupees. From here, I wandered around for a bit more and came across this evil tree monster that spits bombs at you if you run into it. Now of course the concept of this evil tree thing can date all the way back to The Wizard of Oz, where that movie had apple throwing trees. However, these evil trees were later revisited in Tears of the Kingdom where they can walk around and attack Link. From here, I did a lot of collecting where this homeless man under a bridge gave me an empty bottle. I found the Bombus Medallion in the desert that lets you summon a burning ring of fire on the screen, and I got the Quake Medallion by throwing a skull into a ring of rocks, Korok Seed style. This Quake Medallion lets Link summon an earthquake to damage on-screen enemies. Far later in the game, I got the Aether Medallion on Death Mountain, which freezes all of the enemies on screen once used. I didn't use these three medallions much during combat, because they use up a lot of magic, but they're actually required to access certain dungeons that you find throughout the game. After walking around a bit more, I opened a chest and got 300 rupees that I couldn't even hold, and accidentally stumbled across Dark World Dungeon 3, Skull Woods. This dungeon was pretty cool and unique, because it took place both above ground and below grounds, where you have to navigate the Dark World forest and find hidden passageways between the surface and the depths. This dungeon was probably about as difficult as the previous dungeon, and had some pretty tough enemies, but the puzzles were pretty basic. There were these mummy guys that took a lot of hits to kill, and these hand looking things that fall from the ceiling called wall masters, which take you to the beginning of the dungeon if you get snatched. After finding the fire rod, which lets you shoot fire at enemies from a distance, I made my way to the boss's lair. The boss was pretty cool and unique, where it was this moth looking thing that fires magic that you have to avoid, while simultaneously trying to dodge moving spikes and walking on a moving floor. I feel like this boss was probably a lot harder than I made it seem like, where I almost killed it without getting hit once. This is probably due to luck, if I'm being honest, but after killing the boss, I saved the third maiden, and immediately found my way into the fourth Dark World dungeon, called Thieves Town. This dungeon was pretty fun, and the main difficulty of it centered around disorienting the player, where there are a lot of routes you have to traverse, where you can't see where you're going due to walkways above you in the foregrounds. There was also this super trippy room with conveyor belts, a pit, and enemies that you have to defeat, while spikes are moving back and forth. The item of this dungeon was the Titan Mitts, which lets Link carry super heavy objects. This item doesn't really have any use in combat, where it's pretty much only utilized to access new areas that you couldn't access previously. I'd have to say that the boss for this dungeon is arguably the most interesting concept in this game, where you have to find this lady that looks like a maiden in a cell, but it turns out that if you bring her to a specific room in the dungeon and let light hit her, she turns into the dungeon's boss. This is a cool concept in theory, but the execution of the idea isn't the best, in my opinion. When you unlock the cell for the lady, she says, please take me outside. If you do what she says and try to take her to the entrance of the dungeon, or anywhere on the top floor, Floor, she tells Link to, please don't go this way. So basically, when you try to do what she says, she doesn't like that for some strange reason, and you get into an endless loop of not being sure where to go. If she actually wanted Link to walk into a surprise trap, she would have made it clear exactly where she wanted Link to take her. But instead, you have to go through an obscure route of bombing a hole in the ceiling, followed by leading her into a room below to allow light to hit her. This whole part of the game would have been cooler if instead of saying, please take me outside, she marked a location on your map deeper within the dungeon and told you to take her there. And once you arrive at that location deep in the dungeon, she shuts the door behind you, steps into the light, and reveals her true form. If the game went more like that, then the boss's motives would have been more clear of her attempt to trap Link. So once you enter the boss room with her and she reveals her true form, the boss fight starts out relatively easy where you have to hit her head with your sword while she periodically shoots beams at you. However, this boss fight progressively turns into one of the hardest ones in the game, where you eventually have to try and kill her with three of her heads floating around, trying to kill you. Just look at this craziness. I'm not sure how you're expected to dodge all these attacks. Luckily, she didn't take that many hits to kill, so I was able to knock her out and save the fourth maiden. From here, I started to wander around more and found a way to get endless fairies. If you start up the game in the dark world, run down the pyramid, 
Bash into this tree to reveal a fairy. Catch the fairy. Save and quit. And reload your save again. You can keep collecting fairies until you have bottles full of them. This is another reason why potions aren't worth it. Fairies are free. So from here, I walked towards the number 5 on my map and came across this blue warp tile which teleported me to the Dark World, leading me to Dark World Dungeon 5, the Ice Palace. This dungeon was super challenging, where it was quite a bit harder than the previous dungeon. What made it hard in the combat department was ice physics, where you had to fight these penguin things while sliding around on ice, and they take a whole two hearts away if you get hit by one of them with a green tunic. I didn't find this out until towards the end of the dungeon, but you can kill these guys with one hit using a hook shot from a distance, which would have made this dungeon a lot easier for me if I knew that earlier on. This area of the game was also pretty hard in the puzzle department, where you have to do a decent amount of backtracking, and there was a section with a colored switch, where you have to hit a switch a certain way, and then take a roundabout way around the dungeon to push a block to a lower floor, so you can press and hold the switch down. That has to be one of the hardest puzzles in the whole game, and it took me quite a bit of time to try to figure that one out. Also, there was one part in the dungeon that was super annoying, and if you played this game before, you definitely agree with me. There's these set of stairs that you have to walk down, which are almost impossible to walk down due to the ice physics. You have to hit them at precisely the right angle and position to be able to walk down them. Also, what makes it even more annoying is that there's a fire bar right next to you that circles around, which you have to keep moving around from to avoid taking damage. So after getting game over a couple of times and finding the blue mail to reduce damage taken, I finally made my way to the boss of this area, which was a pretty standard boss where you have to melt some ice and then hit these pink cloud things with your sword. It may not look that challenging, but I actually almost got game over, because they take a whole three hearts away from Link if you touch one of these guys, even if you have your blue tunic. So after some careful maneuvering, I took out the boss, saved the fifth maiden, and exited the dungeon. From here, I started exploring the dark world pretty thoroughly, because I kind of neglected that up to this point. So I walked around, found some heart pieces, and came across an item called a magic cape. This item can be toggled on and off, where it allows Link to be invincible and invisible when worn. This thing drains magic like no tomorrow, so I didn't use it all that much, but there were a couple of times where I found this optional item pretty useful to get out of some sticky situations. I also came across a frog guy, who is actually a blacksmith, and if you take him to his partner in the light world, he gives you an upgraded sword. This upgraded sword was super useful in taking down tougher enemies, and it just sounds a lot more powerful when you swing it after you get the upgrade. Just listen to this. With my upgraded sword in hands, I used the warp flute that I talked about earlier to warp to the area marked with the number 6 on my map. This area was pretty cool, where a constant rain falls that's caused by the power of the monsters in the area. If you use the Aether Medallion, you can stop the rain and enter Dungeon 6 of the Dark World, Misery Mire. Before I entered the dungeon though, I was messing around with my magic mirror and found this weird glitch after using the item on the wrong tile, causing me to not be able to revert back to the Dark World. This was pretty easy to fix because I just had to use my warp flute to warp to where I needed to be, but nevertheless, I thought this was pretty weird and I'm sure a lot of people haven't come across a situation like this while playing the game. So from here, I entered Dark World Dungeon 6. This dungeon was pretty hard in the combat department, but there weren't really any puzzles, so I ended up liking the Ice Palace dungeon a little more than this one. You end up finding the Cane of Samaria item, which lets you spawn a block that you can interact with. This item doesn't offer much utility during combat, but it is necessary to progress to certain areas of the game and solve certain puzzles. Also, it was in this dungeon that I met arguably the weirdest enemy in the game, which are these black fuzzball looking things called Zoros, which continuously spawn out of doorways that Link opens with a bomb. They don't try to chase Link, but they damage you if you run into them. I have no idea why they only spawn from a select few passages that you bomb open, and what they're even supposed to be, but let me know in the comments if you have any theories. I think they're supposed to represent some sort of bug that lurks in certain areas of dungeons to add more ambience and life to the game, similar to how if you were exploring an actual cave or dungeon, you would see bugs crawling around minding their own business. So after getting hit by a lot of enemies, I made my way into the boss chamber with no fairies, three hearts remaining, and a dream. I was mentally preparing myself to get a game over when I was shocked at how much of a joke this boss was. It was this giant eyeball monster, accompanied by baby eyeballs that you have to take out with your sword. I didn't get hit by it a single time, and you can literally kill the boss by just standing in the corner and letting the eyeballs run straight into your sword swings. So after taking this guy out with very little effort, I saved the sixth maiden and exited the dungeon. So from here, I made my way straight towards the last number marked on my map, number 7. The trek up to Dungeon 7 in the Dark World was actually quite long, where you had to hike up a mountain and go through caves to scale to the top. At the top of the mountain, you unlock an entrance to the dungeon by using the Quake Medallion. This dungeon is called Turtle Rock, which is honestly the most fitting name imaginable, because the outside is literally some rock shaped like a turtle. 
After entering the mouth of the turtle to access the dungeon, I quickly realized how much magic this dungeon requires for you to progress, where you have to use the Cane of Samaria and Fire Rod numerous times to solve puzzles and move throughout the dungeon. I actually had to stoop down to the potion shop lady's level at one point and buy some green potion, because I kept running out of magic and having to leave the dungeon to get more magic. I'll also say that this dungeon was probably my favorite in the entire game. The combat sections were pretty well balanced and pretty challenging at times, but my favorite part was the puzzles, where this dungeon introduces so many new puzzle concepts that didn't make an appearance prior to this dungeon. Some of these included walking backwards into a door in order to not look at an eyeball mounted on the wall, this cool section where you have to light flames at a certain time on a moving platform to make it to the door before it closes, and this maze section where you're on a moving platform and have to avoid getting hit by fire bars while finding your way out. Those were just the highlights, but this dungeon had me enjoying it throughout the entirety of it. Also, this dungeon was super cool because it showcased the Chain Chomp Mario enemy from Super Mario Bros. 3. There was also this bouncy stack of balls that looks a lot like that pokey enemy from Super Mario World. While trekking through Turtle Rock, I found the dungeon item, which is the Mirror Shield, that lets you block enemy lasers. This isn't a required item to beat the game, but it was super helpful in fighting certain enemies. Also, I thought it was pretty funny how comically large that shield is compared to Link. Like, how was Link even able to see past this huge thing? After some pretty tough combat sections and puzzles, I made my way into the dungeon boss, which was a turtle rock enemy. How fitting, I know. In order to take him out, you have to use your fire rod on its ice head and your ice rod on its fire head. After that, it enters a second phase where it crawls around and you have to hit its abdomen with your sword until you kill it. In addition to this dungeon being my favorite, the boss was actually my favorite boss in the entire game as well, because it wasn't insanely difficult while being a pretty cool idea. In general, this game does a good job of making its dungeons and enemies feel unique, where each dungeon feels pretty memorable and different with its own theming, and no bosses were too much like the rest. Even my least favorite boss in the game was unique looking, at least, even if it didn't pose much of a threat. So once I took out the turtle, I saved the 7th maiden, Princess Zelda, and it was time to enter the final dungeon of the game, Ganon's Tower. Ganon's Tower is located directly next to Turtle Rock, so I entered Ganon's Tower right away after stocking up with some fairies. This last dungeon was definitely a gauntlet to get through, where it was the longest dungeon and it ended up taking me an hour to beat from start to finish, and consisted of 8 total floors. The first half of the dungeon played like a regular dungeon, where there were combat and puzzle sections, but the puzzles made use of every item in Link's arsenal, which helped bring the game together. Although it wasn't required, I even made use of my trusty magic cape to get through a particularly sticky situation. At one point, you fight the boss from the very first dungeon again, except it's on ice, which makes it challenging enough to be a novel experience. Right after that, you pick up the dungeon item, which is the red mail, and this item reduces the amount of damage you take by a considerable amount. The second half of the dungeon didn't have any puzzles, where you move from room to room and kill enemies as you climb up the tower. This part of the dungeon went on a little too long in my opinion, where it felt almost like I would never reach the top. However, once at the top, you confront Aghanim for the second and final time. This boss fight was pretty easy, where you play a game of volleyball again, except the only thing that makes it harder was that there were three of him, but it was also pretty easy to tell who the decoys were. So once taking out the real wizard, Ganon appears, takes the form of a bat, and plunges into the pyramid at the center of the Dark World of Hyrule, and you're able to fall in the pit and take on the final boss. The Ganon fight is definitely the longest boss fight in the game, and it was one of the most challenging boss fights in A Link to the Past. This game doesn't have very challenging boss fights to begin with, however, so Ganon wasn't too much of a challenge. The main part of this boss that made it challenging is knowing where to obtain the special weapon required to beat him, the Silver Arrows. Towards the end of the boss fight, Ganon gets stunned every once in a while, and in order to damage him when he's stunned, you have to shoot him with the silver arrows. The process to get this special weapon is a bit cryptic, in my opinion, where the game doesn't give very many hints on where to find them. If you fall down a pit to the lowest floor during the Ganon fight, you find a hint box that says, When Ganon is stunned, give him his last moment with the silver arrow. This hint doesn't give any indication of where you're supposed to find the silver arrows, it just says that you need them to defeat Ganon. In order to get this item, you have to go to Link's house in the Dark World, purchase the Super Bomb for 100 rupees, place the bomb in front of the cracked wall in the front of the pyramid, and go inside. Once inside, you can throw your arrows in the ponds, and you're greeted by a plump fairy who gives you the silver arrows. She also says that she knows she doesn't quite have the figure of a fairy, and that apparently Ganon's cruel power made her chunky. I think this is a pretty interesting inclusion for this game, as there's no way Nintendo would greenlight something like this in today's society. I guess the early 90s were just a different time. Also, what makes it even more bizarre is that in the official A Link to the Past Player's Guide, published by Nintendo in 1992, they actually referred to this fairy as the Fat Fairy. This guide was also the only clue provided by Nintendo that I could find regarding the location of the Silver Arrows. I wandered around the game quite a bit, talking to NPCs, but couldn't find any hints pointing towards the location of the special weapon. 
Let me know in the comments if I'm missing something in game. Or let me know how you figured out how to get past this part of the game, if you played Link to the Past back in the day. I didn't look up how to find the Soul Reavers online. I just knew that the Fat Fairy was a thing by just being a Zelda fan on the internet over the past several years. Also, another perk to this theory is that if you drop your sword in the ponds, you get the most powerful sword in the game, called the Golden Sword, which turns a golden color. What made accessing this theory super cryptic, in my opinion, was the buildup of obscure events the player has to perform leading up to getting the Silver Arrows. For one, the bomb shop by Link's house doesn't start selling the Super Bomb until after you get the Tempered Sword and after you defeat Dark World Dungeon 6. In order to get the Tempered Sword, you have to bring the frog guy to his blacksmith buddy. So basically, in order to save Hyrule and defeat Ganon, you have to perform this random task of reuniting the blacksmith brothers. Also, what makes it even worse is that you have to wait until you defeat Dark World Dungeon 6 until he stocks the Super Bomb, which is super late into the game. Chances are, once you explore the guy's shop earlier on in the game, you're not going to come back in there again to check what he's selling towards the end of the game, because you have no reason to suspect to check his shop again. Once you actually know that the bomb exists, you have a pretty good chance of knowing to bring it back to the pyramid, because you pass this cracked wall of the pyramid every time you start up a new game. However, with this super bomb being 100 rupees to purchase at each time, chances are that you won't want to walk around much experimenting with it, due to how expensive it is. That was really the only cryptic part in this game that I could think of, but it was hard not to notice while playing. I think Nintendo intentionally made this last part of the game cryptic like this, in the early 90s, so that you would purchase a Nintendo Power subscription or buy the official guide released by Nintendo to figure out what you're supposed to do to beat the game. I read a lot of your guys' comments on my Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 videos that I made, and it seems like a lot of people playing this game back in the day would purchase a guide or a Nintendo Power subscription to try and figure out how to beat those super cryptic NES games. So with my silver arrows in hand, I shot at Ganon while he was in his blue stunned state a few times, and defeated him. In the next room, you're able to talk with the essence of the Triforce, who explains to Link that he is the new owner of the Triforce, and that he can make a wish of his own. Now of course, Link is a silent protagonist, so you don't know exactly what he says, but in the game's credits, it's apparent what he wishes for. The King of Hyrule is back, Link's uncle is brought back to life, and Mr. S moves back to Kakariko Village. Also, I think it's funny how the game spells Sasarala's name differently between the earlier on in the game and the game's credits. Even the developers can't be consistent with the spelling of this guy's tongue twister of a name. At the very end of the credits, Link puts the Master Sword back in his pedestal and it sleeps again forever. That's it for the base game, but I wanted to talk about a few more aspects of this game that I researched more in depthly after my playthrough. You may have noticed this already, but Link has pink hair in this game, despite him being known as being blonde in every Zelda game released before and after Link to the Past. In the game's official instruction manual that came with the game, the artwork shows Link with the blondish hair, so it's apparent that the developers intended to keep the tradition of Link's hair color. However, in the actual game, Link has pink hair, and there's no confirmed reason why the developers made this design choice. Out of all the theories circulating around the internet, I think the one that makes the most sense is that the developers just wanted Link's hair to stand out in the relation to the rest of his character model. In Zelda 1 and 2 on the NES, Link's hair has a brown color, which is the same exact dull color of his sleeves and pants. When A Link to the Past came out, it was branded as being the greatest Zelda adventure yet with amazing graphics, so it makes sense why the developers made Link's hair pink to make him stand out more on old CRT VVs from the early 90s. If you look at Link's model from A Link to the Past when he has the blue tunic on, his cap is yellow and his skin is pretty tan looking, so if he were given brown hair, it all would have blended together and wouldn't look as good. This wasn't confirmed by Nintendo or anything, but it makes the most sense to me. Another thing that I want to talk about is the name of the game, A Link to the Past. There's no time travel in this game, so why is the game named this? Ocarina of Time's name makes sense because you travel time between Young Link and Adult Link, but why is A Link to the Past called this? Well, the answer has to do with the Zelda timeline, where this game takes place before Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 on the NES. This makes sense because A Link to the Past is all about setting the stage for how the Triforce became so important in the land of Hyrule, where the Light World almost got destroyed by Ganon after Ganon discovered the Triforce's whereabouts. In Zelda 1, the next game in the timeline, the Triforce is pretty much already established in Hyrule, where Link has to find the pieces of it to save Zelda. The last thing I wanted to talk about is arguably the most obscure and hidden easter egg from any Zelda game, the Chris Houlihan Room. In A Link to the Past, if you enter a room, cave, or pit, while the game detects an error in Link's Y coordinate, you're sent to a secret room which acts as a failsafe in order to prevent the game from crashing. In this room, there's a bunch of blue rupees that you can collect, as well as a message box that reads, My name is Chris Houlihan. This is my top secret room. Keep it between us, okay? There's multiple paths and entrances that you can take to access this room, which mostly involves Link running around screens with his Pegasus boots and entering a specific area. I found a guide online that walks through a potential route you can take to access this room, and it actually worked the first time I tried it, where I started in Kakariko Village and sprinted my way over to this pit located to the right of Hyrule Castle. 
Not much is known about this Chris Houlihan guy, but it's believed that he was a winner of a Nintendo Power Contest hosted in late 1990, where the winner of that contest had their name programmed into a future Nintendo game, and the game happened to be A Link to the Past. I could honestly make a whole video on this top secret room in this mysterious Chris Houlihan, where there's a lot to talk about, so let me know in the comments if you want me to make a deep dive video on this mysterious room and alleged Nintendo Power Contest winner. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about for A Link to the Past for this video. This game was super fun to play through, despite the minor nitpicks that I mentioned. This game is so much more fun than Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 on the NES, so I can see why a lot of people regard this game as their favorite Zelda game of all time, especially if they grew up playing A Link to the Past as a kid. This game is far from my favorite Zelda game of all time, but that's not saying that this game is bad by any means. I've played every Zelda game, and I've found every single one of them fun to play through. A Link to the Past set the formula for many great Zelda games to come in the future, and that's quite an accomplishment in my opinion. Also, the fact that I could play an over 30 year old game, and still have a fun time with it, is definitely admirable. So that's it for the video. I hope you enjoyed my take on The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Let me know in the comments what your experience with this game was. I'd love to hear it. I've already posted similar videos for Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 on this channel, so check out those if you haven't already. I'm planning on making videos like these for every single Zelda game, probably in chronological order of release, so make sure to subscribe to not miss out on your favorite Zelda games. Next up, I'll be taking a look at the very first handheld Zelda game ever released, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. So with that, I'll see you in the next one.